Hello and welcome back to the Income Generation, the show where we focus on financial topics and information relevant to today's generation of retirees and near retirees. Today we're going to be talking about decision making, which is an exceptionally important topic when it comes to retirement planning. In my nearly 30 years as a financial advisor, I've seen a lot of very intelligent people make poor decisions because they fail to recognize one important reality. That decision making isn't just about how smart or educated you are when it comes to financial matters. It's not just about your IQ, it also involves your EQ, or what we call your emotional intelligence, and the strong influence of emotion in every decision that we make. Naturally, we all have dozens, maybe hundreds of decisions to make every single day. But in the course of a lifetime, there are a handful of truly big ones. Where do I go to college? Am I ready to get married? Do I take this job or that one? And when you get near retirement age, virtually every financial decision you make is a big financial decision. After all, you've built up a lifetime of savings, you have a pool of money, but then you have to decide, where should I invest it to generate income? How can I protect it? Should I make these decisions myself or should I work with a financial professional? That last question might be the biggest of all. And sometimes you might actually feel like you're standing at a crossroads trying to decide which trail to take. Different people are telling you different things. Some encouraging you to do it yourself, saying you don't need help. Others encouraging you not to even dream about doing it yourself. Now, perhaps you've done your own homework and you've really thought this through. You may even have a background in mathematics or finance and a good understanding of the investment world and how it works. Now that's a great start, but it's also why it's so important to talk about financial decision making and why I'm devoting an entire show to this topic. The fact is, many people make decisions based almost entirely on emotion and then use their intellect to justify that decision. The Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman put it this way, we think that we make our own decisions because we have good reasons to make them, even when it's the other way around. We believe in the reasons because we've already made the decision. Here's how I first realized this in my personal decision-making process. As a young man back in the 1990s, I went through a period where I was thinking about buying a Jaguar. It happened to be my dream car at the time. Now, the problem is that I also knew Jaguars had a steep depreciation curve in the next few years. And I thought that I might be able to beat that curve by crunching some numbers and determining which year or how many years old would be the best bang for my buck when buying such a car. So I went to the showroom in full analytical mode in financial nerd mode. I even had my HP 12C calculator with me, which every financial nerd knows is essential for this kind of work. The salesman's name I'll never forget, Chiro. And I showed him my pen and my calculator and I told him that I wanted to look at his NADA books before making a decision. For you who don't know, those are the books which give the values of used cars based upon various years and models and, and mileage and so on and so forth. So he listened politely, he even smiled, even though this was the situation that's basically a salesman's worst nightmare. So he said, Dave, in my experience, I've learned that people make decisions in an instant. And then they spend a lot of time trying to verify and justify them. He continued and said, I can tell that you've already decided to buy a Jaguar. And now you just need to justify it for yourself. So you can sit right here at my desk and you can use your calculator and crunch some numbers through the NADA books. I need to go and wait on some other customers. And when I come back, I'll help you pick out the Jaguar that you already know you're going to buy. I thought, wow, wow, this guy really got in my head. He was absolutely correct. When I really thought about it, I realized that I had made up my mind before walking through that door. All of my calculating was just my attempt to square the decision with the more intellectual side of my brain. Since then, I've seen this phenomenon again and again from Chiro's perspective. Incredibly smart people who simply aren't aware of how strongly their own decisions and the financial markets as a whole are influenced by emotion. They mistakenly believe it's all a numbers game, an external game. But the fact is, there's an inside game that's just as important. This is something that I talk about quite a bit in my new book that I've written that's coming out later this summer, Return on Principle, Seven Guidelines to Keep Your Money Safe in Good Times and Bad. 
Financial decision making isn't just about sitting down with your statements and a calculator. It really starts with looking inward and recognizing the role of emotional intelligence, EQ. It starts with being introspective and determining first whether you are the right person to do your own financial planning. Or if not, whether or not the advisor you're considering or with whom you're currently working is the right person. That's just as important because no two brokers or advisors are alike. And there are plenty who may steer you toward decisions that are strictly analytical and numbers based. They may completely and mistakenly ignore the strong influence that emotion has, not only on individuals, but on the financial markets overall. For me, recognizing that influence played a big role in helping me anticipate the bursting of the tech bubble and the stock market crash of 2000, as well as the financial crisis and the market crash of 2008. And it has served me well ever since when it comes to helping my own clients make sound, smart decisions. I guess I have Chiro to thank for that. I'll talk more about that in today's market breakdown. And later in the show, I'll talk about the do's and don'ts of decision making with our guest. I'll also offer some helpful, practical guidance on financial decision making based in part on my new book. But first, here's today's market breakdown. Read David J. Scranton's groundbreaking new book, Return on Principle, Seven Core Values to Help Protect Your Money in Good Times and Bad. Discover practical solutions to the financial challenges facing today's generation of retirees and near retirees. David Scranton's approach to financial planning is a holistic system designed for maximum protection, strategic growth, and reliable income regardless of market conditions. Available now. What's happening in the financial markets right now to make this such an important topic? The short answer is a lot. Let me explain. As I mentioned, the lesson I got from Chiro, the Jaguar salesman about human nature, helped me prepare for the market crashes of 2000 and 2008. But before the 2000 crash, I had another encounter that reinforced Chiro's lesson. One day back in 1999, I walked into a grocery store on a Saturday wearing a baseball cap with a well-known mutual fund family logo right on the front of it. There was a young man working there stocking shelves. He saw my cap and he asked whether or not I was a financial advisor. When I told him yes, he said, sir, what do you think? Should I buy Amazon stock or eBay stock? What's better? Again, this was a young man in his teens or early 20s. So I asked him, do you have a car? He said, yes. So I asked, do you have a car loan? And he said, yes again. So as I pulled down the brim of my cap and started back down the aisle with my shopping cart, I told him, don't buy either, pay off your car loan. But this whole encounter really bothered me. Why? Because that's when I knew that the markets were deep into a case of what Alan Greenspan had once called irrational exuberance. That's when the stock market mania gets so extreme that it seeps into every corner of society. College kids and teenagers and all kinds of people who really can't afford to take stock market risk were playing in the stock market. That's usually one clear sign that the mania has gone out of control and that the market is about to top out and turn for the worse. And remember, the exuberance is irrational because it isn't based on economic fundamentals. It's purely emotional. That was certainly true back in 1999. As a practicing financial advisor, I already knew that the market was way overvalued. Analytically, I knew the average price of stocks was overinflated relative to corporate profits and that therefore P.E. ratios were too high. I knew that economically a lot of warning signs were in place. Most importantly, I thought analytically from my studies of stock market history that the timing was right for a big change and the upward trend to reverse itself into a downward trend. The long-term secular bull market cycle that started out in 1982 was about to end and go into the next secular bear market cycle. And when I saw just how extreme the irrational exuberance had gotten, the writing was on the wall that change was imminent. But at that time, others were trying to rationalize the warning signs. They were saying that price earnings ratios of 30 or 40 or even 100 for that matter were the new norm. In other words, they're trying to justify their emotionally based decisions to stay in the markets. And this is actually very typical. 
You may recall I talked on a previous show about how each generation seems destined to make its own mistakes when it comes to the financial markets. Specifically, every generation has the tendency to create their own speculative stock market bubbles only to see them burst. And once again, that reality is driven mostly by emotion. When the market's soaring, greed kicks in. Everybody wants as much as they can you know, from their investment portfolios. When things start to fall, fear takes over and the fall gets steeper. That's how these major market drops and rebounds occur so consistently in every secular bear market cycle throughout history. What's more, history shows that there are typically at least three major drops within each long-term bear market cycle. But in the current cycle, we've only had two major drops so far. And that is why I feel so strongly that all of this is so important for investors to understand right now. I've talked before about how our current secular bear market is different from previous cycles for one overriding reason, and that is quantitative easing. Before the Federal Reserve started printing money and manipulating interest rates during the 2007 to 2009 market crash, this cycle seemed to be playing out in classic form. We had the initial crash in 2000, then a recovery to just over the market's previous peak. At the height of that recovery in 2007, we had the same kind of irrational exuberance and mania that I recognized in 1999. We saw this mania despite the fact that many people knew, as far back as March of 2007, that the subprime mortgage crisis was about to hit. There were other warning signs of a coming recession, yet the markets kept climbing, climbing until November, some eight more months. And that was pure emotion. You can almost think of it like the second wind runners get after they've broken through the wall. Adrenaline kicks in, they keep going against all odds. Once they finish the race, of course, the adrenaline wears off and they crash. But here's the difference this time. Since the market bottomed in March of 2009, it's had a third wind. And that third wind hasn't been based on natural factors like irrational exuberance or adrenaline. To a large extent, it's been artificially manufactured through quantitative easing, or as I call it, economic steroids. Against a macroeconomic backdrop that includes both high unemployment and subdued inflation, the FOMC will maintain its highly accommodative policy. Today, the committee took several steps. First, it decided to continue its purchases of agency mortgage-backed securities initiated at the September meeting at a pace of $40 billion per month. Wall Street loved quantitative easing because it created cheap money and forced everyday investors up the risk curve and into riskier investments like stocks and stock mutual funds. And every time the Fed launched a new round of QE or quantitative easing, the natural course of our current market cycle was altered. So the irrational exuberance that should have served as a warning sign that a third major drop was coming soon became completely irrelevant. The third drop probably should have started sometime in 2013 when the market surpassed its previous peak from 2007. That's when the mania and natural adrenaline that pushed the market so high should theoretically have started to wear off and probably would have had it not been for quantitative easing. And now that quantitative easing has been out of our picture for more than a year, we've seen reality start to take hold. Early last year, it started to feel a lot like 1999 and 2007 all over again. But the markets managed to hold their high levels through most of 2015 due to the lingering effects of quantitative easing. Again, I've likened QE to a drug, and as everybody knows, it takes time for a drug to get completely out of your system. But that time might now be very, very near, as evidenced by all the volatility that we've seen in the market since the start of 2016. In fact, the stock market has worse January in history this year, as you probably know. Some central banks around the world have gone to negative interest rates, and even the Federal Reserve has whispered about considering the possibility of negative interest rates after raising them just last December. Why? because they're trying to keep the artificial influence of QE going. But it might just be too little, too late. Full emotion hasn't kicked in yet, but it's starting to, and the central banks are doing everything they can to fight it. And the overriding emotions at this point seem to be fear and nervousness, not irrational exuberance. That tells me that we might already be past all the warning signs. 
It also tells me that this could very well be the start of something much bigger, the beginning of the third major drop that history tells us is likely to occur. If you're not using someone who's well trained in fixed income and you're born before 1966, it may just be time for you to break up with that advisor and move on. I would suggest someone who will care for you through these important years of your life. If you need help finding someone, call or write us. I'd also like to remind you of the special report entitled The Income Generation. This is available free to you, our loyal viewers, online. If you haven't downloaded your report, pick it up after the show. If you're near or in retirement, head over to theincomegeneration.com and download your special report written specifically for the needs of the income generation. Again, those be born before 1966. I'm David Scranton, and you've been watching The Income Generation. Welcome back to The Income Generation. I'm here today with Dan Gardner, author of the books Science of Fear and Future Babel, and also an expert in the field of human psychology. Dan, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Tell us, what role does psychology play in the financial decisions of people? Well, it's absolutely fundamental to every human decision. Um, people think that when they, if you ask them about their thinking, you know, how did you make this decision? How did you do, decide to invest in this or not to invest in that or whatever the decision may be? Uh, they think that their thoughts consist of what they can come up with consciously. It's the information that they thought about, and they thought about it rationally, and they came to a rational decision. But that's an illusion. Uh, there's so much more going on in our decision-making than that. And uh, that's the role of psychology. And one of the central insights of psychology is that uh, vast numbers of unconscious thought processes are at work all the time in our decision making and they are extremely influential in our decision making, much more influential than we tend to think. So I have a financial advisory practice and I still work with individual clients virtually every day. And you know, what would you say to my client that comes in who is the engineer or the actuary or the accountant who denies this, who says, you know, my decisions, I spreadsheet everything, I make very logical decisions, I do my Ben Franklin, and then I act based upon what makes the most sense. What would you say to that person? I would suggest that there is an entire field of science that suggests you are wrong. Um, and I, that can be difficult to accept, but if we're going to be as rational about it as you claim to be, you have to recognize that when there is a veritable mountain of science suggesting that human beings actually are influenced by, as I say, unconscious thought processes, that they are not as rational decision makers that they think they are, they tend to think that they are, that you have to actually respect that science. Um, one of, the, by the way, one of the insights of psychology is something called, quite memorably, bias bias, which is when you explain to people that there are psychological biases involved in decision making that can skew their decision making. They tend to understand that and accept that in regards to other people, right? But in regard to me, oh, no, 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 I uniquely to the human species see things objectively and uh, decide purely rationally. That's bias bias. And it's very, it's a very, very difficult thing to overcome. But the best decision makers do overcome it. One of my favorite examples of this is George Soros. Um, of course, he's politically controversial now, but if you look at his record as an investor through the 60s and 70s and 1980s, he had this amazing record uh, and, and, and the gains to prove it. And when George Soros was asked, uh, as he was so often, George, why are you so good? He always gave exactly the same answer. 
He said, basically, I know that I am fallible. I know that people make mistakes. And I know that I will make mistakes. And therefore, I think more carefully about my decision making and I'm more likely to catch and correct my mistakes than are others. So to some degree, it sounds like you're saying that just acknowledging this, just, just someone understanding that their decisions are made emotionally and then justified logically, is the first step toward helping them make better decisions. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely. I'm a big uh, advocate of Psychology 101. Anybody who is making important decisions uh, about their future, and that's pretty much all of us, really should understand the basics of human psychology. But there's a trick here. If you understand Psychology 101, you may conclude, that's it, I'm bulletproof. You know, I've got it all down. I know about the psychological biases. Therefore, I will not be tripped up by them. That is a danger, and it's a mistake. Uh, in fact, the, the, the great psychologist, the Nobel Prize winning psychologist who uh, is the giant in this field, Daniel Kahneman, uh, he has spent his lifetime studying these psychological biases, and he frankly admits that he too gets tripped up by them from time to time. Uh, you cannot simply say, I am aware of the problem, therefore the problem doesn't apply to me. It always applies to you. And that's why you need to constantly examine your decision making, constantly monitor mm -hmm. for the mistakes. Now I'm suffering from bias bias right now because this entire show is about this very topic. And I so far agree with 110% of everything that you've said. In fact, I even gave a real life example in my own life of how that was a, a hard won lesson. For our viewers though, tell us what, where do you think this has a greater effect on decisions to buy certain investments or on decisions to sell certain investments, if there's any difference at all? I, I don't think that there's necessarily a difference. Um, okay. One of the one of the, uh, we, we we can make mistakes in any field. We can make mistakes of any variety. Um, but when it comes to buying and selling, um, it, it depends upon the particular individual and partic particular individual circumstances. But people tend to be cognitive conservatives, which is to say that once they make a decision, they tend not to adjust that decision in the light of new evidence as much as they should. So if you decide, I'm going to buy this stock, I think it's going to be a winner, and then you start to get new information which suggests, no, it's actually not a winner, people will tend to stick with the stock too long, which is to say you're not, you're, you're not adjusting, you're not selling as enough. But there's a big, big caveat to that because there are other folks, uh, particularly day traders, high volume traders, they actually get into the opposite mistake, which is basically that they're constantly churning and constantly changing the decision and buying and selling and buying and selling and buying and selling. And they're doing that because they have no commitment to their decisions. Uh, and so they, mm -hmm. it, you know, because they're, because they're not actually really believing that, you know, this, this stock is a winner if I hang on to it long enough. And so there's no commitment. And so they're, they're too free and easy when it comes to, when it comes to the decision, okay, I'm gonna sell it, off it goes. So there are opposite problems there. Generally, if we're talking generally about the, the, the species, the problem tends to be that we're too cognitively conservative. We don't change our minds enough, but we always have to be aware that there's also an opposite problem. So for all the husbands watching the show right now, as our wives already know, uh, I think what Dan's saying is we absolutely just don't want to admit that we're wrong and made a mistake in the first place. So we've, we've got to take a quick commercial break right now, but stay with us. We'll continue this very intriguing interview with Dan Gardner as soon as we're back. We'll be right back. Closing numbers on the markets today. At one point, the market fell uh, as if down a well over 700 points. Well, Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. We're down by between three and four and a half percent generally across these markets. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. We're red everywhere essentially, down by four or five percent. We're down over 16 percent. Dow at the same time has fallen about 18 percent. The stock market is now down 21 percent. Because we're now down 43 percent. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Finally, there is an alternative. 
read David J. Scranton's groundbreaking new book, Return on Principle, Seven Core Values to Help Protect Your Money in Good Times and Bad. Discover practical solutions to the financial challenges facing today's generation of retirees and near retirees. Learn the truth about Wall Street, the financial media, and the secrets they try to hide from everyday investors. This isn't just another book about investing. Working Americans who have lived through two major stock market crashes and the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression in the past 16 years don't need another book about investing. David Scranton's approach to financial planning is a holistic system designed for maximum protection, strategic growth, and reliable income regardless of market conditions. Stop planning for retirement with your fingers crossed. Plan with confidence, knowledge, and peace of mind. Read Return on Principle, Seven Core Values to Help Protect Your Money in Good Times and Bad. Available now. Welcome back. I'm here today with Dan Gardner. Uh, Dan, tell us about this brain science that you refer to in the science of fear. Yeah, well, that's basically uh, the, the, the science of uh, the psychology of decision making, um, which is which is to go back to Daniel Kahneman, uh, system one and system two, to use his his terms which is basically system one, or rather system two, is the uh, system of thought, which we are consciously aware of. And so when I say to you, how did you make this decision? And you say, well, I thought about this fact and that fact, and I came up with that conclusion. That's system two. But system one uh, is called system one because it actually uh, comes in before, typically comes before system two in our decision making. It's all those uh, uh, thought processes that we're not aware of, um, and they happen quickly. They deliver judgments in the form of intuitions, hunches, uh, and they come to us instantaneously. And typically, at that point, our conscious mind sort of takes a look at what the unconscious mind has come up with, and it can adjust it. Uh, it can say that's completely bonkers and overrule it. But typically what happens is that the conscious mind does not get involved to the extent that it should. And that's what makes the unconscious thought processes so influential. Basically, we're a bit lazy. We, you know, conscious thought, really looking at our feelings. When we have a strong sense that something is true, we tend not to bring conscious thought to bear and examine that feeling and ask ourselves if it really makes sense. We tend to be a little bit lazy in that regard. That's what makes system one so influential in our decision making. So it sounds like to some degree, it's human nature. We look for the easy button. If we feel confident, we don't look any further. We accept it as being true and we move on. That, that's exactly right. Um, and, and that's very clear. There's abundant evidence to indicate that when we have a strong intuition, we'll, we'll likely just go with that. And there are all sorts of other ways in which we tend to take uh, cognitive shortcuts. Um, so, for example, uh, something called attribute substitution. If I ask you a question uh, that's important for a, a forecast or for an investment, uh, and the question is difficult, you will, consciously or not, you'll adjust it slightly to come to a related question that feels intuitively easy to answer. And then you'll mm -hmm. answer that intuitively easy question, and you'll feel that you answered the first question, but you didn't really answer the first question, you answered the second yeah. question, which isn't quite the same. And that happens all the time. And when we look mm -hmm. at good decision makers, good investors, what you find time and again is that they're very precise, very careful, and you can't they don't fool themselves. They don't get diverted in that way. Mm -hmm. Now, Dan, you talk about this a bit in your book, Super Forecasting. Tell us more about how this psychology actually uh, can help somebody looking forward in attempts to forecast things. Yeah. Well, Super Forecasting, the title comes from uh, an enormous research program undertaken by my co-author, Phil Tetlock, who's a very eminent psychologist mm -hmm. at uh, Wharton. Uh, and one of the leading researchers in the field of forecasting. And uh, over the course of four years in a uh, intelligence community uh, a sponsored tournament, 
uh, Phil had uh, thousands of volunteers. In fact, over four years, over the course of four years, more than 20,000 volunteers were involved. And they made forecasts about big, important geopolitical and economic events, like will Greece default? How will China's GDP do in the fourth quarter? That sort of thing. Big, difficult questions. And at the end of the four years, with so many people making so many forecasts, they were able to figure out that there was a very small number of people who had excellent forecasting skill. Uh, and they were consistently excellent, which tells you you're looking mostly at skill, not luck. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, well, what is it about them that makes them so good? Well, after what I've just discussed about the importance of catching and correcting your psychologically induced mistakes, you won't be surprised to hear that one of the very first things that's so important about these super forecasters is that they are slow, cautious, careful, rigorous thinkers. The people who sort of, they have an immediate strong sense that they have a, of what the answer is, and they, they're, they're fixed, they're determined. Maybe they go up and get some new information to support that belief, but they stick with that, and ultimately that's their final answer. That's what most people tend to do. That's what, we, that's what our psychology impels us to do. These super forecasters do exactly the opposite. They basically set that in, initial intuitive response aside, and then they look exactly at the forecasting question. They break it down very carefully. They break it down and say, how can I possibly answer this? How do I research the problem? What are the, component what are the information components that I need? And then they proceed step by meth methodical step. It's a very slow, mm -hmm. painful, rigorous, demanding process but it works and what's interesting is when you look at how super forecasters make their forecasts which are demonstrably excellent i mentioned george soros earlier in the interview uh if you know the writing of george soros it's very very similar basically uh george soros uh i'm sure that sure. if he had competed in this tournament he too would have been a super forecaster so what you're saying in a word is just say no to data mining re re, re fight the urge to data mine and Look for data that supports what you hope is true. Dan, we have to wrap up today, but it's been a real pleasure. I thank you so much for adding value today on the show. Thank you so much. And uh, for our viewers, stay with us. Uh, we're going to go with Morgan, a one on one with myself and Morgan as soon as we get back. And we're going to talk more about the psychology of investing and the things that you need to be aware of in order to make the best financial decisions for your own personal situation. We'll be right back. If you're near or in retirement, head over to the incomegeneration.com and download your special report written specifically for the needs of the income generation. Again, those be born before 1966. I'm David Scranton and you've been watching the income generation. This is a fascinating topic. I'm really learning a lot about myself and how and why I make decisions. And what I'm hoping our income generation members get out of the show today mm -hmm. is that's really what's more important when it comes to investing your money is about the inner game, not the outer game. And you focus on this in your new book, as you've mentioned. That's right. And the new book is entitled, as you're well aware, mm -hmm. Return on Principle, The Seven Core Values That Keep Your Money Safe in Good Times and Bad. Well, with that in mind, why don't we take this segment to talk about those principles sure. one by one. Absolutely. Okay, well, the first one is protecting your assets must be your first priority. I mean, I think this seems kind of like a no-brainer, right? Well, you think so, but the problem, if you think about most of the income generation members, mm -hmm. they got serious about your investments in the best bull market in U.S. history during the 80s and 90s. So everyone turned into an offensive coordinator to make a football analogy, yeah. but they forgot that having a defensive coordinator can be even more important. And although they've been reminded of that in the last 16 years, it's still difficult to make that transition once you get your mindset into investing under a certain paradigm. So how did you as a financial advisor really make your focus about protecting assets and not so much trying to get a massive amounts of wealth? Well, it wasn't always that way. It okay. started back in the late 1990s when I looked at where the stock market was going mm -hmm. and I determined that most likely we were going to go into a long-term bear market cycle. 
uh, which was going to have several significant drops within it. And I had to do something that most other advisors weren't willing to do. I had to have the courage to change my business model off from the, away from the offensive side into the defensive side when I knew that that offensive coordinator role really wasn't going to be in the best interest of my clients any longer. Okay. And that brings us to core value number two, mm -hmm. which is investing is all in the details. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Detail orientation. You know, mm -hmm. if somebody is picking mutual funds, for example, and they look at the report and they say, ooh, this is a five-star fund or a four-star fund, looks good, mm -hmm. I'm going to choose it, sure. then they're probably not best suited to manage their own money because the, 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 you have to have a detail orientation to look much further beyond that. Okay. There are five-star rated funds that are very aggressive and there are five-star rated funds that are very conservative. At the end of the day, you've got to realize that if you want to be conservative, the star ratings alone, for example, aren't enough. You got to look beyond that and look into the details, absolutely. Which is maybe why managing your own money is not always the best course of action. But let's go into and, principle um, number three. Unless you hold these seven core values, exactly. Okay, so you can learn. Principle number three is hard work and diligence pay off. And I know we all want to believe that's true in every facet of life, but how does it apply to saving and investing? It applies in every way possible. For mm -hmm. example, our company, Sound Income Strategies, when we invest in fixed income, for example, bonds and bond-like instruments, we do something that most advisors don't. Okay. Most advisors, when they're looking at bonds, they simply look at the ratings, the Moody's ratings, the Standard & Poor's ratings, and so mm -hmm. on. But we learned back in 2008 during the financial crisis that you can't always trust the rating services to have their level of scrutiny as high as ours is. So we actually look beyond that. We look at the balance sheets, the income statements, the cash flow statements. Okay. And it's that level of, of really detail orientation that somebody should have in order to be a successful investor. All the details. Yep. And principle number four is be coachable. What does that mean exactly? Well. When you talk about being coachable, mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is that you're open-minded. See, if you're working with an advisor, you have to be coachable, okay. but that advisor also has to be coachable. Mm. If you're with a, if you're doing it yourself, you also need to be coachable. You need to be able to read things and change. I mean, there's times mm -hmm. when your paradigm may start off one way, as I mentioned before, especially for those of us who got invested, beginning, began investing in the greatest bull market in U.S. history, the 80s and 90s, but then you have to look out what's around and be coachable and say, well, if we're in a different world now, maybe, just maybe, we need to learn a different skill set that's going to help us in this world. So it's almost being open-minded, if you will. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. That's right. And principle number five is leadership is more important than giving orders. Now, why is that important to remember? Well, when I talk about leadership, it's more or less leadership about yourself, internal leadership. Okay. The ability to say, you know, I, I've, I've got to be able to move away from the pack when I know that what the pack or the herd is doing is no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. And some people don't have that ability. You know, a lot of people just are natural born followers. They're not leaders. If they don't see a whole bunch of other people that are doing something differently, they just don't feel comfortable. Okay. And that's where leadership comes in. It really becomes more of an internal leadership story, in, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And if you are more of a follower type personality, that's okay. You just need a good leader. That's true. And, and, and that's the most important thing here, too, is to realize that these, these seven core values are mm -hmm. applicable to you whether you're doing it yourself or whether you have an advisor because you can't automatically assume that your financial advisor holds these seven core values near, or near and dear to his or her heart also. So for the do-it-yourselfers watching the show, it's so important that you make sure that you have these seven core values. And if not, it's important to ask questions about your, to your financial advisor as to, okay, are, do you have these core values? In fact, in the book, we actually have questions for the do-it-yourselfer to ask him or herself, okay. as well as questions that you could use as interview questions for your oh. own financial advisor. Okay. Well, I can't wait to get to the last two, but we got to take a quick commercial break first. That's right, we do. I get so excited about this topic, <laughs> it's, it's I forget exciting. about the commercial break. So <laughs> stay with us. We'll be right back. We'll talk about the last two core values and then how to better determine whether or not you have what it takes to do it yourself. We'll be right back. This is fun. This is great. Three, two, one. But I'd like to take a few seconds and tell you why I decided to write the book entitled Return on Principle. Basically, it all boils down to this. Let's face it, you deserve to live a happy retirement. It's as simple as that. But for many, the subject of money, finance, and math is complicated. 
Here's a fun fact. Many Americans claim that they'd much rather clean a toilet than calculate a tip in a restaurant. Uh, thank you, I, I guess. But it doesn't have to be that complicated. Using the seven core values I outline in my book, you, you too will be able to build a life based upon the right core principles. Cut. Return on Principle isn't just a book about financial investing, it's about investing in your life. I know for a fact that you're going to love it. Okay, now, now it's just getting a little weird here. Welcome back to The Income Generation. I'm Morgan Thompson here with David Scranton. And we are talking about the seven core values that keep your money safe in good times and bad. And we are on to number six, which is honesty is essential. You say it's not important, it is essential. What does this mean? Well, we're talking here about self-honesty. You see, mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's really being honest about whether or not you possess all the other core values. Okay. You know, it, it, are you overprotective of your own money? Are you detail-oriented? Are you diligent? Are you coachable? Okay. Um, do you have leadership qualities? Again, are you willing to stray from the pact when you know it's in the best interest of your own money? So honesty has to do with being honest to yourself. Okay. You know, it's funny, sometimes how we envision ourselves as people is different from how we really are. So it's important that you don't fall into the trap of doing what I call blowing smoke up your own bum. You know, you... We're all guilty. <laughs> we're all guilty of that at one time or another, right? Yes. Um, I, you know, I, I tell myself every day that I've got a full head of hair and it's brown, <laughs> when really I have half a head of hair and it's half gray. So that's what honesty is really about, being brutally honest with yourself. Okay. And in the case of an advisor, having an advisor mm. who's been able to be brutally honest with him or herself about changes in, in his or her business model that perhaps he should have made or she should have made, but didn't when looking backward. If that person finds that they've made mistakes, but yet still tends to back up and defend their business model, then to me that's, that's a clue that you have an advisor that may not be honest with him or herself. Okay. And as an advisor and as an investing professional, you have some stories about this. Can you share them with us? Oh, absolutely. One, well, one story in particular is, is kind of interesting. I was somewhat horrified about by a response that I'd gotten from a realtor when I had done something that I thought was a no-brainer. Okay. I thought it was the absolute only thing to do. I was looking for my house right down here in Florida mm -hmm. and I had called in a, a particular real estate broker and I said to her, look, I'm going to put you through a lot of work. And this <laughs> is during the financial crisis in 2008 when values were starting to drop. I said, I'm going to put you through a lot of work. I'm going to come down on Saturday and Sunday. I want to see 10 homes on Saturday, 10 homes on Sunday, and I'm going to go back. And I might do this several weekends in a row. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, we'll, I'll make a decision as to what I want. And my promise is if you're willing to have the patience to, to, to go through this process with me, I will buy a house through you. Okay. Well, wouldn't you know it, after she showed me through 30, 40 homes, the house that I fell in love with happened to be a for sale by owner home. Ooh. So I had a real dilemma, but I loved the house, so I made an offer, they accepted it, and I bought this beautiful for sale by owner home, which is really my dream home. Mm. So I called up the real estate broker after, and I said, what's your address? I need to send you a check. And what I did was I basically calculated how much her commissions would have been had I bought that same priced house through her, uh -huh. and I actually wrote her a check. Wow. And much to my dismay, she said to me, she was surprised, she says, I, nobody's ever done this before. And I said, really? It's only the fair thing to do. I gave you my word. But I guess honesty as a value is not as commonplace as we all might hope. Well, it really should be. And that brings us to principle number seven. Fearless investing means peace of mind and a secure future. Well, the word fearless certainly seems relevant to today's show about the role of emotions in financial decision making. So how would you summarize this principle? Because being fearless, that's a really big statement. Oh, of course. And it's not so much about being a, a fearless investor because okay. fear is good. You know, <laughs> if you're standing at the edge of a cliff and you have no harness, nothing to support you, having a little bit of fear is actually a good thing. It protects you. Okay. Well, same thing is true with the financial markets. You know, I always say, you know, if you're out on a boat, you have to have a healthy respect for the water. If you mm -hmm. get too, too arrogant when you're, when you're running a boat, it's, you could very easily end up getting into trouble. So fear sometimes protects us. Is that's good, okay. having a healthy respect for the financial markets. Mm -hmm. But what I'm referring to mostly is having a fearless retirement, having the ability to paint the retirement that you've always dreamt of. Okay. 
and not falling back into something that's a subpar retirement given your goals. But the key to doing this mm -hmm. is having your investment portfolio in a conservative enough way so that you can plan a fearless retirement, you can have the confidence that you've got the repetitive income coming in day after day to be able to live that fearless retirement. You know, the days of just baby boomers retiring, the income generation members retiring, and playing golf and then taking a nap and sitting at home <laughs> watching TV, those days are over. Right. You know? And that's what fearless retirement is really truly about, and that's the seventh Principle. So being able to really enjoy it and travel and live your life, not just, like you said, take a nap and be done with it. That's right. But in order to be able to do that, you know, you, you can't be arrogant about it. Having that mm. confidence is one thing, but if you're invested totally in the stock market, then at the end of the day, you probably shouldn't have that confidence or peace of mind. So the secret, I believe, is being in things when you're retired that give you constant, repeatable, predictable income. So. Decisions, decisions. You know, as I said at the top of the show, we're all faced with dozens, if not hundreds of them every single day. But in the course of a lifetime, there are a small handful of decisions that seem to stand out. Those are the really big decisions. And as you get closer to retirement age, pretty much all of your financial decisions become big ones. That's why I wanted to focus on this topic today. It's always important. But given where we are right now with our economy and the financial markets, it is even more important than ever before. If we have, in fact, already entered the third major drop of this current long-term secular bear market cycle, the one that I speak about on the show every single week, or if we're about to phase into it, then good decision-making right now is vital. Choosing the right path is vital. That's why I say that good decision-making starts with looking inward and recognizing all of the influences at work, knowing the importance of not just your IQ, but also your EQ, your emotional intelligence. And when it comes to decision making around financial planning, it starts with first deciding whether or not you really are the right person for the job. If not, then the next step is to determine whether or not the advisor with whom you're working or with whom, about whom you're considering is the right person. I actually have a list of questions to help you with that decision in my new book, Return on Principle. Because the reality is financial advisors as a group are wired the same as everybody else. And each of them is wired differently from the other. Some are naturally wired to be good advisors from an EQ standpoint, and others simply are not, just like individual do-it-yourselfers. Some recognize the important role of emotion in decision-making and in the financial markets, while others ignore it. For me, developing my personal EQ and my understanding of this subject played a big part in my own decision to become a specialist in what I call the universe of non-stock market income-generating strategies. To this day, I really appreciate the emotions that these strategies instill in me as well as in my clients. Emotions like security, peace of mind, and confidence in the future. Thanks for watching.